I'm Ned. I'm Ned. Oh, that was amazing. Um, so uh, talk today, enough machine learning to make Hacker News readable again. Um, I do want to put in parentheses that I'm going to be saying the occasional aside snarky thing about Hacker News. Um, I don't know if that upsets you, whatever. Um, I checked. I've actually had an account for six and a half years in Hacker News, um, which was, yeah. Oof. Anyway. Um, so I am Ned Jackson Lovely. I'm Ned JL on the Twitters, NJL at NJL.us. These slides are available on my website. Uh, I gave this talk at PyCon. That's up there. Ironically enough, it made Hacker News. Um, <laughs> and we'll talk about that later. Um, I'm an engineer at Spotify. We have pretty sweet digs here in Manhattan, um, except I work up in Boston with a bunch of machine learning people. But the digs here in Manhattan are pretty sweet, and I'm pretty sure we're hiring. Anyway. Um, the goal here is to do a simple, achievable project with machine learning. Uh, for me, this was a personalized filter for Hacker News. Simple, achievable project. This is what I wanted. I wanted to dip my toe in the water with machine learning. Um, I've got all of this sort of random knowledge I've accumulated with working with a bunch of people with PhDs in this stuff. And I wanted to do some real stuff of my own um, and sort of flesh out uh, sort of where the rubber meets the road. And the whole theme of my talk is I can machine learn and you can too, <laughs> right? So, so machine learning, uh, particularly like I, I look at some of the other talks that are being given and I'm scared of them. Uh, you know, like uh, trust the lasso, I will be there and I will not follow any of it, but it will be amazing. <laughs> and, and so I think, but the thing about machine learning is uh, like the real message I want to give here is that machine learning is starting to transform itself from something which is in the realm of science and scientists only into something which is becoming more um, engineering, directly applicable. There are toolkits you can go out there and you can start using them, right? You don't need to know, um, you don't need to know how to make an I-beam to make a bridge. And you don't need to know uh, advanced mathematics. It helps, but you don't need to know the advanced mathematics in order to make a real application that makes real use of machine learning. And what is machine learning anyway? Uh, machine learning is super fancy, intimidating name we give for <laughs> the machine was mad at me. Um, machine, learning, machine learning is just applying statistics to big piles of data. That's all it is. Don't let people scare you with this stuff. Um, there's this old saw that everything is artificial intelligence until we understand it, and then it just becomes computer science. Right? So machine learning, machine learning is super awesome, scary name for this thing, which is just applying statistics to data. All right? So this stuff is becoming just computer science. Um, so what do you, so I work with a bunch of people who have doctorates in this stuff, and they do machine learning all day and think really deep thoughts. And I talk to them about what they do, and they do basically four things. They get a bunch of data. They engineer the data. They massage it into formats that fit well into these machine learning algorithms. Um, they train and tune models, and then they apply the models. These two parts, that's libraries, right? Most of the real thinking, most of the hard work happens in these first two. Where do you get all this data from? Do you scrape the web? Do you have to uh, you know, run a bunch of stuff through Mechanical Turk? Um, engineering the data, how do we take arbitrary blobs of text and turn them into nice arrays of NumPy numbers that we can feed into all of these libraries and stuff? So there's a lot, of, a lot of the work happens up here. They will spend weeks up here, and they might spend a couple days down here. Right? So I'm going to be mostly talking about this thing called scikit-learn. So basically, you pip install NumPy, and then you go get like a cup of coffee. Um, and, then, and then you come back, and you pip install, um, you pip install scikit, and you, you go and you get a donut. Um, and then you come back, and you have to install a Fortran compiler, and then you do it again. Um, and then you come back from lunch, and then you pip install scikit-learn. And in those simple, easy steps, um, easy steps that take a very long time, you end up with a complete machine learning toolkit on your laptop that you can do real work with, real awesome machine learning, like just right there. Um, whoa! You know what I'm going to do? Hold on a sec here. I don't know why that picture's not showing up. Nice. 
There we go. All right. This is the picture I wanted. So um, what this picture is, is uh, a flow chart that's on the... <laughs> I'm just going to wiggle all the cables. So I want to just stand here and like hold the RGB thing in. Um, all right. I think that's going to work. Um, so this is a flow chart. It's kind of a little cut off, so you can't see it that well. But the idea is you walk. So, and I'm going to give you a hint. You're going to find some really scary. You're going to, you're going to find some really scary articles when you Google. And they're going to have crazy math in them. And read, the, read this like scientific publication. And whenever you see math you don't understand, say blah, 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 and keep going. I'm not kidding at all. You don't need to understand the proofs. You don't need to understand exactly why the kernel method works. You just kind of need to like, oh, I get a feel for what's going on. And you need to recognize the terminology, right? So that when the terminology comes up again as a parameter you're passing into something, you kind of know what's going on and you know if it's something you need to worry about or not, okay? So my, my, my entire statement here I want to say is you can approach this, you can learn this, you can do this as a, you know, what's the word, autodidact? You can stumble your way towards understanding machine learning. You don't need to have a giant background in statistics and um, linear algebra. It helps, but you don't need it. Stuff is just like flashing at random over here. I... All right. Is there any other way I can plug into this thing? All right, so anyway, so this thing you keep hearing about a lot, and I think the term is worth talking about bringing out, is the idea of supervised learning versus unsupervised learning. Basically, the way to, way to separate these in your head is supervised learning is you have a bunch of, you have a lump of data, and then you have something that comes out of that lump of data. It might be a category, it might be a number, but what you want to do is you want to say, with this lump of data, can I predict what that other thing is? All right, so uh, for a spam filter, the, the result might be spam or not spam, and you want to say, based on this email, is it spam or not spam? You want to make that guess in the future. Or you might want to say, um, this article reached this certain score on Hacker News. Can I look at another article and guess what score it might reach? Right? So that would be supervised learning. You're kind of, you've got some data and you're trying to guess and predict what this other value would be assigned to it in the future. Uh, unsupervised learning is I have a pile of data and I want to learn something interesting about it. It's really just that straightforward. So unsupervised covers a lot of other things. Um, we're mostly going to be talking about uh, supervised learning because uh, that's, as far as I'm concerned, a lot of the really interesting stuff is in supervised learning. Lots of great books. Uh, these two O'Reilly ones I found very helpful for kind of understanding the idea of taking arbitrary text and turning it into numbers because um, that's a lot of what I find really interesting is teaching computers to extract interesting stuff off of random things I've scraped off the web. Uh, the two packed books are a little bit more directly relevant towards, uh, you know, what we're actually talking about here, trying to do some real predictions. Um, Scikit-learn patterns. So you got to kind of understand a couple things about how Scikit-learn thinks, or I guess the people who wrote Scikit-learn think. Um, and then you can use that as you're kind of going through the library to understand what they're up to. So first things first, uh, this idea of parallel arrays. You're going to pass in an X and a Y. X and Y are both arrays. X is your input, Y is your output. That's simple enough, right? So X might be an array of blobs of text. Y might be an array of Boolean true false for is this spam or not, for example. That makes sense? All right, so first thing you need to do, um, this is just good hygiene, is you set aside a validation set. So the idea here is I could make the perfect machine learning algorithm that given some input would always spit out the proper answer, right? I just remember what I saw, I remember what the answer was and I give it back to you, right? That's, that, would be, that would be perfect. Hey, I see this article, I know it scored 27, I show you 27. I see this email, I know it was spam, I tell you it was spam. So what you need to do is you need to set aside a chunk of your data. You need to say, this is something I'm not going to touch until the very end just to see how I was doing. 
Does that make sense? So you have this new data, fresh data. It hasn't affected your decision-making process in any way. At the very end, you can make a about how this model you've trained will do on some arbitrary brand new data. So um, this is uh, super important for avoiding something called overfitting. Uh, Google overfitting, if you care, don't do it. So uh, basically what I did was I ran this thing um, and it split out into uh, a testing set and a validation set. All of my data is in MongoDB because I'm really lazy. Mm -hmm. And um, I basically just flagged, every, I ran this once and I flagged everything that was in the validation set in MongoDB as being part of the validation set and then all of my queries would not pull out the validation set and it made it very straightforward and easy for me to just kind of mess around with stuff moving into the future. Um, so anyway, how do I work? You build pipelines and then you optimize parameters. So what are pipelines? It's a sequence of operations on data. It's kind of there in the name, right? And uh, a pipeline is just this thing where you, you give it sort of a, a list of tuples. This is a very simple pipeline. There's only two things here. First thing is a hashing vectorizer, which takes blobs of text and turns them into NumPy arrays. And a linear uh, support vector classifier, which is this awesome, amazing support vector machines are like the, this incredibly awesome, always works magic. They're fast. Every time I think I understand how they work, I talk to somebody who does and I realize I'm wrong. <laughs> but they're, it's like, it's like planes and hyperplanes to separate out stuff and then there's kernel tricks and I don't even know what that does. Um, but they're amazing and they work really well um, and you can kind of get a feel for what the characteristics of support vector machines are and what are they good at and what are they not good at, right? But in any event, so this pipeline, I basically feed it in an array of X's and Y's and it will just train itself and then I can feed it in an array of X's and it will make predictions. It's that straightforward. So, but how do we like tune these? So this uh, support vector machine, there are several different kinds of support vector machines. There's that kernel thing I alluded to that's called the kernel trick where you're not doing planes, you're doing twisted hyperplanes, I don't even know. And there's all these other things you can do to tune this magic deep inside. Um, how do you know what you should be tuning? You do the Googles, you find some papers, and you see what kind of things do they talk about as being important things to tune and parameters to tune. Um, so there's this amazing, amazing uh, thing in scikit-learn. Uh, there's a couple different uh, versions, but I find the, the grid search to be the one that I find most, uh, like I can comprehend it most easily and understand what it's doing. Um, but basically, you have these hyperparameters, these high-level parameters that you use to tune how the machine is going to train itself. And what you can do is you can say, uh, for the support vector machine, for the C, pass in 0 .51, 2 .0, 4 0.5, for the loss function, try both loss 1 and loss 2. Uh, for the hashing vectorizer, we're going to try different kinds of n-grams. And so if you look, that's four options, two options, two options. It will try all 16 possible combinations of these options. All right? So right here, verbose equals two. That means give me a little log output so I feel like something's happening. Um, and n underscore jobs equals negative one means start up a job for every processor on my machine. Right? So you, you, uh, you start this up. You look at h top. All of the bars are red all the way to the right. The fan goes on. The laptop gets hot. Um, <laughs> I set mine down on something that I'm not worried about catching on fire, no joke. And I, you walk away and you come back in five or six minutes and it tells you that, you know what, uh, 0.5 L2 and, and uh, you know, that uh, unigrams and bigrams are the way to go, right? And it has, gives you this sort of trained model that you can then use to do predictions with. It's fabulous. Um, this is kind of the hard part in machine learning and people have written libraries and tools to do it, so you can just use them, it's great. Um, so functions you're going to see a lot of in scikit-learn, transform, fit, and predict. Uh, so transform, the idea here is you're going to pass in some value and you're going to transform the value into some more useful value further down the line. So uh, for example here we have, uh, I'm passing in a couple lines from uh, import this. So simple is better than complex, sparse is better than dense. That's blobs of text. I want to turn those into numbers because all of the all of the things in scikit-learn are using numbers. So uh, it just turns it into this sparse matrix with 10 stored elements. You know, so there's 10 elements, one for each word. Um, pretty cool. Uh, fit just trains it. So we have this uh, support vector combinator, uh, sorry, sorry for support vector classifier. Uh, we're gonna say uh, fit with this input data and that, that uh, you know, expected value. It'll just go ahead and train it. 
the support vector machine, that thing right there, we can pickle it, we can use it in the future, we can make predictions with it. How do we make predictions? We just pass in stuff and it returns predictions. That's it. Right? That's, that's your production code. Um, there's probably some other stuff around it, but, <laughs> but that's mostly production code. Um, but the real world is super messy, right? So the whole, the whole reason why I want to do this is I knew a lot of the theory. I'd played around with a lot of these details. I wanted to like actually go out there and do some real world stuff, right? Um, so getting the data, uh, there's been a couple talks about, uh, about uh, all sorts of various and sundry uh, scraping stuff off of websites. Um, but I use requests in LXML. I like them both. Um, I then wrote this uh, web app uh, where I sat there and for about six weeks I classified everything that made the front two pages of Hacker News into stuff. I, I called it Drek and not Drek, actually. Um, yeah. And so I had good and bad buttons and I had a bring the pain button that would just iframe things and repeatedly vote on them. Um, I found I didn't read Hacker News a lot after I did this. Um, yeah. <laughs> Ooh, did I burn out? Anyway, um, about 18% of stuff on Hacker News uh, I classified as not Drek, so that gives you an idea. Um, so I had this ton of data after all this, right? So I got title, URL, submitter, content, rank, votes, comments, time of day, and Drek or not, right? And so this is all stuff I can just scrape or record as I'm grabbing the stuff. Uh, this was the hard fought, hard won, um, you know, 20 minutes to half an hour of pain a day for six weeks. Which, you know, you think about it, it's not that bad. Um, let's me read Hacker News much faster now. Now, we want to take all that messy data, that random blob of stuff, and we want to make nicely normalized NumPy arrays. We want, uh, you know, things to be centered on zero with a standard deviation of plus or minus one. We want, you know, just nice, neat data, not blobs of text or URLs. Um, lots of techniques to do this, to turn words into text. There's an entire great talk just around this subject that I've, got to write someday, about just taking blobs of text and turning blobs of text into numbers, because this is a really interesting problem. Um, bag of words is one. Uh, so the idea is uh, time flies like an arrow, fruit flies like bananas. This is like one of these classic really hard sentences, right? Like, what's the verb? What's the noun? What's going on here? Um, grammar's hard. So let's... So... <laughs> So what bag of words does is uh, there's, there's kind of a couple different ways to do it. Basically, you just say, all right, we'll treat it as a bag of words. Oh, fly showed up twice, like showed up twice, Bitcoin didn't show up at all. Um, and <laughs> and there's a period where this was not very common in Hacker News. Um, and so, so the idea here is we have this like, set of this, this, this just simple count of is it there or is it not there? And this, is, this can be pretty indicative of stuff, right? Um, you can also do true and false as well as like number of times the words appear. There's a couple different techniques here. Um, people like to throw around n-gram and bigram and trigram and unigram and all sorts of things, which are really fancy ways of saying glob and words together. Okay, so uh, if we treat uh, time flies like an arrow, fruit flies like bananas, if we say, hey, let's do bigrams or two grams, I guess, you'd say time flies, flies like, like an and arrow, arrow fruit, and the idea is we're capturing just a little bit of the grammar, not enough to make it hard. Not enough that we actually have to do a lot of work here, but just a little hint of the grammar. And the idea is by capturing just this little hint of the grammar, the fact that words are next to each other, we can perhaps get some, some better predictive power out of things, right? And so we treat time flies like that was a word, pretty much, and then we do bag of words. Um, normalization is super fun. Um, I played with this a lot. Uh, the idea is uh, two words here, um, both of which are really fun. Uh, stemming and lemmatization. Um, and the idea behind these is, what if you could take a word and turn it sort of into a normalized form? So if somebody's talking about flying, do we really care if they're using the past tense or the present tense or the future tense or the past participle or whatever? What if we could just turn it into some generic word? So when he flies, he likes to fly upon early flights. When he fly, he likes to fly upon early flight. So this is kind of trying to normalize those words down and uh, make them a little bit more generic so that you can try to find commonalities, right? Um, uh, this is using a, using a heuristic to try to do this, which I just think is amazing that that works at all. Um, there's also this thing called stop words. The idea behind stop words is there's a lot of glue in the English language, a and the, right, those sort of things. Um, just toss them, right? If a writer uses um, the word six, that's probably not particularly helpful, right? That shows up in a lot of writing. Uh, over, move, anyway, that, that's not really necessarily indicative. Um, it might be, but 
can be really useful to just yank out these stop words. Uh, slightly more advanced here, term frequency inverse document frequency. The idea here is if a word shows up in a particular document more often than it does sort of in the corpus of all documents as a whole, maybe that's a really important word and we should be boosting it. All right, there's a lot of work and math behind doing this right, but this is how you do it in scikit-learn. Right, you can just go ahead and import the TF-IDF uh, vectorizer and you're good to go. Make sense? All right, so um, engineering features is this whole other like next step. Like, how do you, uh, you okay back there? All right. Uh, so the idea is, uh, I've got a bunch of text I scraped off the web. How can I make this more relevant, right? And one way you can do this, uh, there's this thing called readability, which is a browser plugin. And somebody went ahead and rewrote the browser plugin in Python, backed by LXML and a bunch of heuristics to try to pull out just the main text and skip all of that extra junk around the edges of a, uh, of a website. So uh, this is a uh, function that takes a bunch of raw HTML and does its best to clean it up. You can also roll your own features. So I had a theory that I liked articles which were longer. So I created a feature which basically just counts how many characters are in an article and returns that back as this nice little set of numbers. Um, and then I put that in a pipeline, because I love pipelines, um, with a standard scaler. And what the standard scaler does is it takes my arbitrary numbers of, you know, this article's 10,000, this article's 100,000, and it makes them numbers that are centered on zero, standard deviation plus or minus one, which works out really well for all the, the future things in my, uh, in my pipeline. You can combine features together, so I can take that term frequency inverse document frequency vectorizer, I can take that length pipeline I just wrote, and I can put them together so that the output of these two things both are flowing up through and combining into one single unit of, uh, of, uh, of, of data that then gets fed into the classifiers. Um, my data starts as a dictionary. This is, another this is another transform I wrote where I can feed one of the dictionaries straight out of the database. Into my, uh, into my pipeline and pull out the relevant properties. And uh, this was another thing I tried. Maybe host names are relevant. So what this does is this pulls out the host name, so it uses URL parse to parse the URL that was linked to in Hacker News, pulls out the host name, and then uh, I put that into a pipeline. Sorry, I'm going a little fast. I'm running out of time. Uh, throw that into a pipeline to try to pull out and figure out uh, you know, uh, numbers that represent what host names uh, certain uh, things came from. So there's an actual application. Um, this is pretty much all it does. Uh, I load in a pickle. Uh, a plea for sanity right here. Save all of your input data. Save it all. Because this pickle is going to work awesome for two years. And then you're going to do some sort of upgrade on something and your old pickle will not work anymore and you will be very, very sad. So save your training data. The S3 is wonderful. I got a giant blob of stuff on S3, um, and I know that you know, when I do a pip install and all of a sudden scikit-learn is updated and stuff isn't working anymore, I can, uh, I can recreate my ridiculous pickle. Um, this is what my app looks like. Uh, green readable stuff is there, red stuff is over here. Um, this is the don't read. Uh, this is the read. Um, there's also other colors. There's orange for actual like Hacker News, like on Hacker News posts. Uh, blue means I couldn't scrape any text, um, which probably means don't read it, but I decided to give them the benefit of the doubt. Um, yeah. It's at hn.njl.us. It crashes every once in a while. Um, and like I said, I don't read Hacker News much anymore, so I don't notice for like a day or two. Um, but I actually do use this to sort of filter out Hacker News for me. Um, and now, so if you have all this data, if you've been scraping Hacker News and you have all this great data, there's a lot of wonderful stuff you can do. Um, all sorts of awesome stuff you can do. Um, so unsupervised learning, so we talked about like you can take data, try to see insights and what can I get out of this data without doing additional work. Um, what about clustering Hacker News articles? Hey, look, there's the... I don't know, the NSA cluster, there's the, well, you know, whatever sort of things are coming up. Oh, here's people arguing about, you know, the future of Python cluster or something. And then uh, regression. I kind of touched on this a little bit. 
predicting article scores, I think, would be hysterically fun, and I don't want to do it. Like, that, that, that way lies darkness. Um, so you could totally find a couple websites, scrape their RSS feeds, and predict which ones will do well on Hacker News and try to post them before anybody else. I'm just saying. <laughs> um, like I said, I'm like, that is not, like, I will not come out of that weekend feeling better about myself. Um, anyway, so like I said, machine learning is becoming engineering. This has become something that you can reach out and do and touch and press the buttons and screw up and put into production and get phone calls at, you know, 4 o'clock in the morning on a Thursday. What, whatever, this is stuff you can really use to do real stuff in the real world for real people. Um, it's becoming engineering. You don't need to be a scientist anymore. Go out and do stuff with this. Um, it's there and it's there to be done. It's there and ready for you to grab and use. Uh, thank you very much. Like I said, Ned Jackson, lovely. <laughs> JL and JL US, five up there. Awesome. Do I have time for questions or am I? I do. It looks like I got like four minutes. Yeah. Yep. I'm I I wrote so many stupid things on top of uh, like I I I'm embarrassed to show it. I actually wrote something that um, lets me put several pipelines in parallel, and then we'll do a optimize optimization across the different pipelines in parallel. So I sidestep all of these by basically. Um, I, I wrote like the world's largest pipeline. And so I wrote this gigantic pipeline and then it tries all the possible combinations, all, this, all the stuff that would do all of this, and then it will save out the pieces that actually worked and retrain the model <laughs> with, without all of the additional, with the, all the additional choosing between different pipelines and stuff. Um, but yeah, pickle everything. Like that's kind of my like, I, I pickle everything, I version it all, and I have an S3 bucket that's nothing but like a series of pickles with date and time stamps and, and lots of notes. So, yeah, uh, you then you. Yes, so, you stayed awake. <laughs> yes, um, have you ever run this on the new page and seen it? Are there it, articles that are really personally interesting to you that don't ever make it to the front? Yeah, so, uh, oh, it's. So, I'm sorry, sir. Yep. Awesome. Uh, let's give a big warm. Thank you, Ned. Yep.